This video is brought to you by Audible. Go to audible.com slash Sarah Z or text Sarah Z to 500 500 and get a free 30 day trial. God, I remember when young adult dystopia novels were absolutely everywhere and they were the shit. I just remember so vividly being this 13 year old with all this barely concealed rage at life and the system just absolutely devouring like the Hunger Games and Maze Runner and Divergent and Legend and Uglies and feeling like I could take on the world and the government and my parents and school and the man. I would consume teen revolutionary protagonist after teen revolutionary protagonist and just buy everything I could find at chapters that seems to even vaguely hint at some horrible dystopian world just to watch it fall apart. It was great. And it wasn't just me either. Back in the early to mid 2010s, young adult dystopian novels were the YA genre. These things were selling tens of millions of copies, people couldn't get enough of the Hunger Games movies, and everyone was talking about Jennifer Lawrence. Well, most people. My co-writer Emily had to read the Hunger Games for school, and you know what reading things for school does to your enjoyment of a book, so she hated it so much that she wrote this absolutely scathing review of it. One of my opinions that seems to be questioned and misunderstood is my opinion of Suzanne Collins' novel, The Hunger Games. It seems that everyone I talk to about this book thinks that it is an exciting, thought-provoking adventure. I, however, am on the complete opposite side. I believe that this book is a boring, meaningless, plot-hole-filled mess. But detractors aside, YA dystopian novels and their film adaptations were absolutely fucking huge. Until suddenly, they just kind of weren't anymore. Around 2016-ish, the genre just kind of started to fade into obscurity. Contemporary social issue books and royal intrigue stories titled some dumb bullshit like A Noun of Nouns and Nouns, seemingly filling the niche left behind by your divergence and what have you. The whole thing nowadays feels almost like a distant memory, with nothing but some leftover hot topic Mockingjay pins to remind us of it all. And that kind of made me wonder, like, what happened to the genre? I mean, people are still publishing some of it, but it's just not the cultural juggernaut that it was in 2014. Like, what was it about YA dystopia that gripped the hearts and minds of so many teenagers back then? What was the genre like at its height? And finally, where did it go? What made audiences decide they just weren't super interested in the genre anymore? Well, as with many things, it turns out that's a pretty complex question. So please sit back and let me take you on a deep dive into some stories that aim to answer a profound and thought-provoking question. What if the government was bad? So in order to understand what gave way to the rise in the 2010s YA dystopia craze, we have to look at the actual genre as a whole. For one, the 2010s weren't actually the first time we had this big massive rise in dystopia as a literary genre. There was actually also this huge boom in dystopian novels in the post-war years, particularly coming out of the 1950s and the 1960s. Works before then were few and far between, although the ones that did exist in the 30s-ish are considered some of the most foundational and iconic. Stuff like like Brave New World, or It Can't Happen Here, or even 1984 that wrestled with the harms of authoritarian state control were created in the context of rising fascism, oftentimes taking these ideas to their most horrific extremes. And in the post-war years, we would only see that popularity boom. The instability in a number of governments globally mixed with the entire world feeling the after effects of the Second World War was the perfect breeding ground for stories that not only reflected on contemporary politics and worst case scenarios of fascism and global instability, but also general themes of like war's horrors and the most terrifying implications of weapons that can cause destruction on a previously unprecedented scale. This is where you got dystopian works like Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451, where books were banned. Fun fact, in my grade 9 English class, I quote unquote directed a short film project based on Fahrenheit 451 where books were banned in the modern day. It was terrible. I blame Bradbury. Why did they ban the books? Why did people hate books so much? You know I'm not allowed to talk about that. 
But you also got stuff like Lord of the Flies, a book very much steeped in the context of how a recent war affects people, particularly children, or the original book behind Soylent Green, or more uh, neoliberal shit like Atlas Shrugged, or that short story Harrison Bergeron that they made us all read in English class with some very weird themes when you focus on it too hard. This was the decade of Planet of the Apes, and Clockwork Orange, and Android's Dream of Electric Sheep, and Logan's Run, all this speculative stuff that took people's post-war anxieties and brought them to their worst extremes. This was a huge decade for the dystopian genre, and while it wasn't all good per se, it very much reflected said anxieties. Or at least the post-war anxieties of the demographics writing these books, which at the time was mostly white European guys and also Ayn Rand. One thing you might have noticed about these, however, is that the scope and demographics to whom post-war dystopian fiction was geared was very different from how it looks now. As in, there's no YA shit here, not really. This is the adult dystopian era. It's not for kids. People in these books can drink and they can say whatever the hell they want. Any of these little fuckers ever pop out of the Ministry of Truth? Like, I guess A Wrinkle in Time could be argued to be some form of dystopia, but that's the only major book from that era that was geared toward children that I can really think of. And while stuff like Animal Farm and 1984 often get assigned to high schoolers in classes nowadays, they weren't exactly the target demographic. The 1970s and 1980s didn't see a huge shift in this direction either. Um, Yvonne Xiao's History of Dystopian Literature, which I'll link in the description, describes 1970s dystopia onward as taking on on a more feminist and environmentalist lean as these movements came closer to the mainstream. This is where you'd see works like uh, The Ones Who Walk Away From Amalas, and The Handmaid's Tale, or The Sheep Look Up, or Sea of Glass, often stuff that preys on fears of corporatism and global degradation. Or in the case of Amalas, critiques of globalized exploitation, and also to some extent just utilitarianism that comes with it. There were a few books in this general era that were either geared more toward youth or focusing on youth as characters, but it wasn't a huge demographic either. This is where you'd finally start to see works like Stephen King's The Long Walk, a story that almost certainly served as inspiration for The Hunger Games, or The Guardians, another YA dystopia, or technically even the fucking Lorax, if that counts. Again, themes of environmentalism. But the biggest shift came in the 80s and 90s. The trend of suddenly marketing books more to young readers wasn't exclusive to dystopian YA. You'd see a huge shift in books geared toward kids and teens over those years in general. The young adult in the context of literature was only even coined in the 60s, so this was a new market that kind of exploded. But in the context of dystopia, we finally started to see this niche subgenre of dystopian works geared toward 12 to to 18 year old readers. Also, unsurprisingly, we started getting into themes of nuclear anxieties and fears over nuclear fallout again because it was the 80s. So you'd see stuff like Children of the Dust, a 1985 YA book about the fallout from nuclear war. But likely the most famous YA series to come from that era was The Giver Trilogy. The Giver, released in 1993, focuses on themes of pain and memory and the dangers of totalitarianism, and it does so through the eyes of a very young protagonist to whom the audience is supposed to connect. The Giver was a huge success, selling 12 million copies and winning a Newbery Award, even though there isn't even a dog that dies in it. <laughs> and in the wake of The Giver, we started to see a rise in what authors now recognized clearly was a possible marketing need. The late 90s and early 2000s gave us stuff like Shades Children, a dystopia about how fucked up it would be if all the adults in the world disappeared, or Gone, a dystopia about how fucked up it would be if all the adults in the world disappeared, and oftentimes these stories would very much start to explore not adult fears like the rise of fascism and nuclear fallout, but concepts that kids and teenagers could understand and relate to. Those aforementioned series asked us to consider not only the fear of losing the adults who you rely upon, but also contain metaphorical elements of hell is other people, especially gone, which is just very true if you're a nerdy child and have to interact with any other children at length. Scott Westerfield's Ugly series explores the beauty expectations placed on teenagers. Neil Shusterman's Unwind series talks about the power that parents have over their children and the ways they're often abused and quite literally treated as disposable. Oftentimes, themes of identity would really come through 
these books in a way that was never as prominent a theme when these books were marketed exclusively to adults. You know, City of Ember talks a lot more about identity than Animal Farm does for several reasons, but part of it is that when you're a kid, identity is uh, fucked and confusing. And now there was this entire subgenre of books that just reflected that, and often reflected that by taking teen anxieties about, like, am I pretty enough? Or how come I don't have rights because I'm 13? And placing them in these heightened settings where they could be fought. But as much as the early 2000s led to what was, relative to before, a boom in dystopian young adult books, we had seen nothing compared to what was about to happen to the genre. Because in 2008, this little book called The Hunger Games came out, and the world of YA dystopia would never be the same. So when The Hunger Games first came onto the scene, it wasn't necessarily an inherently groundbreaking premise. It wasn't the first piece of dystopian YA fiction in recent years, nor was it the first female-led story or anything of the sort, but when the first book written by Suzanne Collins dropped, it made a pretty fucking huge splash. Also, this doesn't really fit anywhere in the video, but did y'all know that Suzanne Collins wrote the Little Bear movie? If you've been living under a rock or in a bombed out resistance shelter for the past decade and a half, The Hunger Games essentially revolved around a post-apocalyptic version of North America run by an evil dictator named President Snow, where the continent was divided into a number of rigidly separated districts, each with their own production specialties, and then the wealthy capital where all the rich evil people lived. That is mahogany. Every year, as a form of maintaining control over the capital's people and also as punishment for an attempted rebellion 75 years ago, the capital forces two randomly selected teenagers from each district to fight each other to the death in a competition called The Hunger Games, all while televised to the public in true reality TV form. The Hunger Games book centers around a teenage girl named Katniss who ends up volunteering to take her little sister's place in the competition and ends up having to fight, scheme, and fake date the cute boy from her district, all in order to survive. The story had a few key inspirations, the most obvious of which is Koshin Takami's 1999 novel Battle Royale. It has a very similar premise. A group full of teens is randomly selected by an evil government and forced to fight to the death each year, and some key details, like various zones in the arena that will cause horrible things to happen to you if you stay in them, the game designers blowing you up if you don't follow their instructions properly, are pretty clearly present in both stories. Although the actual premise is fairly similar to Battle Royale, the differences come in primarily in those details. What the characters are like, how they interact with each other in the general competition, and how the story ultimately unfolds and resolves itself. Nevertheless, the very similar central premise of evil government forces teenagers to fight each other to the death led to a little bit of a backlash in which Collins was accused of essentially ripping off Battle Royale. Another key inspiration, according to Collins, was the Greek myth of Theseus and the Minotaur, where every year a number of children are forced to be sacrificed to the Minotaur because evil government punishing its people. Finally, and this is also a key difference from Battle Royale, the televised nature of the Hunger Games and the general concept of violence as entertainment drew largely both from traditions of Roman gladiatorial matches and an increasingly fucked up-ness of reality TV. This was around the time where you had reality shows like The Swan, where they put desperate women through inhumane levels of mental stress and surgical alterations, and people getting extreme malnutrition on Survivor, and tons of shows that seemed to exist only to document and often gawk at various forms of human suffering. Altogether, these various inspirations combined to create the first Hunger Games book, and it was very well received. Like, beyond the obvious analysis of people liking Katniss as a protagonist and people finding the romance arc compelling, especially because romantic subplots in YA dystopia, while not unheard of, weren't yet an expected staple of the genre, it was also just generally liked for its action, its pacing, and just being a pretty compelling and exciting read with decent social commentary. The story started to dive into themes of class inequality and family in a way that was simple enough for young readers while still not talking down to them, and the often
often fairly graphic violence was a big draw. The series gained enough popularity, in fact, that less than a year later, Lionsgate agreed to co-produce a potential film adaptation. Lionsgate had, at the time, been producing relatively smaller and not particularly profitable pictures like Kick-Ass and Repo the Genetic Opera and the Saw movies, so this had a potential to be a pretty huge deal for them. The film remained in development for the next couple of years, cast announcements beginning a short ways into 2011. Jennifer Lawrence, who at the time hadn't done a huge amount of mainstream work save for X-Men, was cast to play Katniss, winning out over other actors like Shailene Woodley and Emma Roberts, and also apparently Saoirse Ronan. <laughs> Later announcements brought in Josh Hutcherson to play Katniss's fake dating partner turned to actual partner PETA, and Liam Hemsworth to play Katniss's childhood best friend and I guess technically romantic rival to PETA, Gail. During the time that casting was announced, some of the actors who would be in the movie were pretty mistreated whether it be by fans or mainstream tabloids. For example, there were some fans who were outraged with the casting of black actors to represent District 11's tributes, and those actors were subject to a barrage of racist abuse from those fans. And like, to be clear, those characters are black in the books. It wasn't even like a matter of adding diversity where it didn't previously exist, which by the way, also would have been fine and wouldn't have warranted that reaction. But people were literally just outraged and racist toward black actors, one of whom, I must add, was 14 years old at the time for playing a black character. If you want to know more about that and see more specifics of the kind of abuse the actors received, there's a really good video essay called The Day Rue Became Black, which not only talks about the racist way a lot of fans reacted, but also why it's incredibly important that Rue, a character who symbolizes youth and innocence, was a little black girl. I'll put the link in the description. There was also some tabloid scrutiny and misogynistic abuse directed toward Jennifer Lawrence for being slightly less thin than other mainstream Hollywood actresses at the time because Hollywood. Still thin, mind you, but just a bit less thin than some other actors. All just very normal reactions to actors playing characters. By the end of 2011, filming had completed and people were getting pretty excited to see the novel's characters on the big screen. The announcement of an upcoming Hunger Games movie encouraged a lot of people, especially young female readers, to buy the book, leading to a surge in sales and in, well, the hype. Keep in mind that Harry Potter finished all its films midway through 2011, meaning there was this sort of mainstream cultural attitude at the time of like, well, we need to find the next Harry Potter. We need to find the next big name series that's going to hook the youths and make us a lot of money. And The Hunger Games, with its teen focus, action-packed story, and general themes of questioning authority and the value of found family, looked like it could be just that. Also, I, I just have to say props to Suzanne Collins for not tweeting. Not to mention, their acquisition of names like Taylor Swift on the soundtrack or a Hemsworth in the cast helped build up a lot of hype among, again, largely young women. I talked a little bit about this during the Twilight video, but some of the draw for young women was also just the protagonist's status as a strong female character in the very physical, literal sense. If you do some searching, you'll find a ton of memes from the time directly comparing Katniss and Bella Swan as female protagonists, with the thesis statement being like, Katniss feminist and good because she shoot deer with bow, Bella unfeminist and bad because she sad cry over vampire boyfriend. Lots of stuff about like Katniss hating Bella or beating her in a fight and stuff. So it was very much the case that some of the adoption of The Hunger Games in the time leading up to and surrounding the film's release very much came from its direct comparisons to other popular YA works at the time, whether it's we want this to be as good as Harry Potter or just we want this to be better than Twilight. So the first Hunger Games film dropped in August 2012, and it's a not bad movie. Like, don't get me wrong, it definitely has its problems from weird cinematography to awkward costuming to special effects that just kind of break immersion but those are by and large just issues with the film not being insanely high budget and coming from a studio that hadn't made a profit in years. But it generally managed to keep the same tension that was present in the books, portray most of the main characters in a fairly faithful way, mostly, more on that later, and portray its relationships in a generally compelling and believable fashion. And it was a fucking success. The film earned nearly $700 million internationally, making it Lionsgate's most profitable film ever made by its second day of release. It topped the box office for weeks, was one of the first 14 films ever to make $400 million at the time, and still remains one of the top movies in terms of advanced ticket purchases. This thing made a shitload 
shitload of money and a shitload of waves very, very quickly. Critics generally praised its action, social commentary, and acting, and fans were, by and large, quite happy with what managed to get adapted onto screen. That's not to say The Hunger Games was a completely faithful adaptation of the book, however. Most notably, despite The Hunger Games movie still being a pretty violent film and its premise still being about teenagers doing a bunch of murders to each other, the film adaptation was somewhat sanitized and just had a little bit less bite and a little bit less to say compared compared to the book. Besides the removal of Katniss's only female friend with whom she had a vaguely gay friendship, we also lost themes like the role of disability in both protagonists' journey, some of the more graphic evils of the capital, Katniss's more ruthless nature as the games go on, and although they got a mention in later movies, the capital just straight up cutting people's tongues out. There were also some critiques of whitewashing Katniss, whose book description as being olive-skinned led some audience members, especially indigenous ones, to think that she shouldn't have been played by pale Jennifer Lawrence. Also, just in general, some of the bite was just a little toned down. Even stuff like both main characters planning to poison themselves with berries and then being stopped. In the movie, they're just about to put the berries in their mouths, while in the book, they already have them in their mouths and have to actually like spit them out. It's just a lot of tiny little details like that that are just a little less visceral than what readers would have experienced. Probably necessary for the film to keep its PG-13 rating, but still worth acknowledging. On the other hand, one thing we did get with the film was the expanded role of people who were not Katniss. The book is told in first person and exclusively through Katniss's perspective. So while we get some understanding that the people designing the games and running the capital are doing evil work behind the scenes, we don't really see it because the entire competition is dressed up in this reality TV facade. In the movie, however, we get a few scenes between the evil President Snow and the folks designing the game, largely because Snow's actor Donald Sutherland was really interested in his character and wanted to give him more depth and focus. Getting to see the capital and a rationalization for the Hunger Games from a top-down perspective is a really welcome addition to the series and also provides the viewer with a little bit more leeway to suspend disbelief and enter a world where a government could make kids fight to the death. Also, the scenes where all the evil game makers and evil monochromatic uniforms mess with a hollow projector of the game arena are pretty cool. Minus the child murder, it honestly looks like a pretty fun job. Despite a few changes, some well-received and some not, the Hunger Games film was a rousing success. It had already been known before the first movie's release that it was going to get a sequel, given that the book is part of a trilogy and they had signed off on an adaptation of its second part already, Catching Fire. But after the release of the film, that knowledge turned into hype. The Hunger Games' fan community, something that already existed prior to the film, skyrocketed in popularity, leading to a massive fandom and a near obsession with everything to do with the actors. For a while, Jennifer Lawrence became the darling of the internet because of her perceived irreverence and lack of desire to conform to the mainstream Hollywood actress model. Her talk in interviews about loving pizza and thinking Hollywood is dumb was pretty new for a lot of fans, and her relatable nature made her beloved by a now huge Hunger Games fandom. Oh yeah. And we get there, and I'm like, where's the pizza? And then, my mom's and then like, you want me to order like, oh my god, you want me to order it? And I just like looked at her, and I was like, oh. like oh. By the time Catching Fire released, Lawrence was chosen as one of Time's most influential people in the world, and the Hunger Games train was not finished. The turnaround time for these films was, all things considered, pretty quick, with the second film releasing only a year later. Catching Fire puts Katniss back in the deadly arena. Where we left off, she managed to save both her and her fake love interest PETA's lives, which a lot of people were starting to see as a sign of rebellion against the Capitol. Desperate to quell its fires, the Capitol aims to kill them both off by hosting a special Hunger Games consisting exclusively of previous victors, for which there was some precedent, but it was very much there to kill Katniss. Catching Fire is, at least in my opinion, the best of all the Hunger Games movies. That's definitely an impressive feat because, at least on paper, we're just gonna do the exact same premise of the first story, but a second time could become very frustrating and also just very repetitive. But the film manages to pull it off, creating not only a challenging new setting that Katniss has to fight and survive in, but introducing a quite likable cast of characters and adapting them well for the big screen. The expanded cast is definitely one of its highlights. One of the less compelling parts of the first film is that there are very few tributes who you can actually root for and get attached to and be super sad if they die. 
Katniss, Peeta, and Rue are the only ones who really get any significant development, and with a few small moments as exceptions, everyone else is kind of just an asshole out to kill them. It makes sense in the context of the game, and it certainly raises the tension in terms of Katniss's need to survive, but it also doesn't leave too much in the way of interesting dynamics or interactions. The addition of the adult characters to Catching Fire, many of whom have been out of the games for a while and therefore have interesting perspectives on broader life in the capital really fleshes out both the competition and the world as a whole. We also get a deeper exploration of the Katniss and Peeta relationship, some very fun action moments, more Stanley Tucci, which is just always a good thing, and a pretty compelling ending that builds a lot of hype for the adaptation of part three of the trilogy, Mockingjay. Or, well, adaptations. They did that thing every YA adaptation film studio decided to do for a while after Harry Potter did it and split Mockingjay into two movies. More on that in a sec. But broadly speaking, Catching Fire was a good movie and it was generally received as such. Catching Fire is currently the highest grossing film Lionsgate has ever produced, the most profitable of all the Hunger Games films, and also the Hunger Games film with the highest rating on Rotten Tomatoes, for whatever that's worth. The franchise saw no sign of slowing down, especially because Mockingjay Part 1 and Mockingjay Part 2 were slated to be released in the next two respective years. They were churning these out quickly without compromising on quality along the way, and fans were eating them up. Of course, because The Hunger Games was such a lucrative project, that also meant the series needed to generate more revenue than just ticket sales, which meant things like the creation of Hunger Games merchandise and wider marketing. And the way these films started to become marketed around that time was just extremely fucking funny. So one of the ways the class disparity in The Hunger Games is demonstrated visually is through the style and opulence of Pan Am's wealthy capital. The rich people, both in the books and the movies, are dressed extremely fucking stupidly, as if just trying to show off that they can afford every piece of fabric and every color and every pigment of makeup and every wig while they feast on elaborate spreads of food in front of the recently starving tributes. It's very visual, very conspicuous, and also very much much not presented as a good thing. Which is why, of course, in 2013, to promote the release of Catching Fire, CoverGirl collaborated with the series to create a makeup line inspired by the Capitol. The Capitol Collection, as it was sincerely actually called, advertised weird, ostentatious beauty looks with models styled to look like rich people from the Capitol. The franchise also partnered with Subway to sell Catching Fire branded sandwiches called Fiery Footlongs. There is an entire dedicated website with a special Catching Fire Subway trailer so you could buy creamy, spicy sriracha sandwiches in honor of the Hunger Games characters. Bold can be standing up for what you believe in. Bold can be testing your limits and defying all odds. And now, Bold can be found at Subway. Fiery footlongs, a revolution in bold taste. Sizzling subs like the new Sriracha Chicken Melt, drizzled in our own signature Sriracha, made with a select blend of chili peppers for our boldest flavor yet. Get yours and get to theaters November 22nd for The Hunger Games Catching Fire. Subway. Be bold, eat fresh. I guess I kind of get why they did it, because like bread is a consistent theme throughout the books, like Katniss's life is saved with bread, and the evil government is named after the Latin phrase for bread and circuses, but I just love the fact that this film series about starving, impoverished people rising up against a totalitarian government was like, brought to you by Subway, which my co-writer Emily can assure you from personal experience working there is its own form of a totalitarian government. There was also stuff like pink Hasbro bow and arrow sets, you know, so you know it's for girls. I mean, you remember how Katniss would fight with a Hello Kitty weapon in the arena? You can do that too now, girls! Like, the series was credited with helping a lot of girls get into archery, and that's really, really cool, but also just… wow. There was also the way the love triangle became an almost aggressive part of the series' marketing. As the series continued, especially with Catching Fire as insanely popular and successful as it was, there was this huge surge in articles and quizzes and actors being interviewed about it, and just this huge surge in The Hunger Games being marketed as a love triangle story. And like, I do get it, because the series was succeeding Twilight as the next big female-oriented craze, and the love triangle in Twilight was so huge, and so I can't blame them for trying to fill that niche, and clearly a lot of fans were really invested in the apparent love triangle, even though Gale is the obvious choice, and there were some hints of that in the book, so like, I can't fault them too hard for this. 
But it's just very funny because in the books, this romantic narrative of Katniss and Peeta was largely cooked up at the behest of a totalitarian government. Like, the story was never actually about a love triangle, although it does make use of the characters fake dating and then falling in love trope to some extent. Even to the extent where a romantic subplot between Katniss and Peeta does indeed come into existence, it's still not a romance-centric story in the same way Twilight is, it's just a story that has romance in it. And so to see so many of the story's themes be reduced down to, are you Team Peeta or Team Gale in so much of the marketing and pop culture response to the series is just very odd. In a lot of ways, it feels like the kind of marketing that would come from the evil government itself. Like, yeah, selling capital makeup is a very capital thing to do. But I guess who needs the capital when you have capitalism? But I think the funniest iteration of this comes from the release of the third Hunger Games movie, Mockingjay Part 1. In Mockingjay Part 1, Katniss sings this folk song called The Hanging Tree, and she uses it as this almost rallying cry. It's this kind of eerie tune from the perspective of a man who was hanged for murder taken straight from the books. And then they, okay, the marketers made a fucking dance remix of The Hanging Tree and sold it on iTunes and called it the Rebel Remix, and it's honestly incredibly fucking funny. Take a listen. Come into the tree, into the tree. where dead men called out. It's still available to stream on Spotify. I don't know, this song about a man being hanged that's this creepy and somber moment that symbolizes resistance being set to a fucking dance beat and being sold online is such a perfect symbol of the way marketing for this series worked that I would honestly think it was too on the nose if someone made this up. Like, a series that criticizes wealth inequality and capitalism and talks about how these things are concealed by flashy lights and reality TV and fancy clothes, then being advertised with a dance remix of a resistance song and a makeup line and Subway sandwiches is honestly just incredible. But dance remix aside, how was Mockingjay Part 1? Uh, it was okay. Let me first say that this book did not nearly have enough material to justify being two films. Like, I get that Harry Potter did it, and Twilight did it, and now everyone's doing it, but fuck. <laughs> Honestly, the worst part of part one is just that some of the pacing is incredibly nothing. Some of it is fairly faithful to the book in the sense that Katniss discovers this secret resistance bomb shelter with this Hillary Clinton-ass woman who wants to help take over the evil government, and she basically finds herself turned into a propaganda pawn for them as her entire role is now drumming up support for the resistance, which I don't think is an inherently bad premise or anything like that, especially when a lot of YA dystopia kind of hand waves away the existence of, like, other adult revolutionaries with their own goals and ulterior motives to focus on the hot teen protagonists saving the world. But the issue with Mockingjay Part 1 is that that kind of takes up the entire movie without much growth or change from that premise. We're treated to long extended scenes of Katniss going to a place and filming something and running from an explosion and then being sad and then going to a place and filming something and running from an explosion and then being sad and then going to a place and, well, you get the gist. It's just paced very slowly, likely because it has to stretch out an already very thin first half of a book into an entire feature length film for monies. Another interesting change from the books was the relationship between Katniss and the aforementioned President Coyne, the resistance leader who seems to be all about overthrowing the capital and instilling democracy. In the books, these two butt heads quite a bit quite early on, with Katniss, who is traumatized and unwilling to trust, picking up on a lot of Coyne's sketchiness quickly and Coyne being concerned about Katniss becoming just so important to the rebellion that she threatens Coyne's power. It's all building up to, uh, spoilers for the last book, that came out almost a decade ago, I guess, Katniss killing President Coyne instead of President Snow after she realizes Coyne is, like, also a fascist and would be just as bad, if not worse, than Snow if she were able to gain power. In Mockingjay Part 1, though, their relationship is, like, pretty chill and amicable. She's a little ruthless, but overall just seems pretty much fine and seems to like Katniss well enough and vice versa. Even in the added scenes where Katniss isn't there, she's being, like, fine. <laughs> she's a politician, but that's pretty much it. The idea was that, since the next film wouldn't air for another year, they wanted Katniss killing Coyne to be this big, shocking moment and didn't want to make it obvious that the story was leading up to that. Which, 
in my opinion at least, is just very stupid and is kind of the natural conclusion of this weird spoiler culture where films are designed primarily to shock you on the first viewing and nothing else. Like, if you can tell where the story is going, then the story did its job. Instead, we get this weirdly dissonant moment when she suddenly starts acting inexplicably murdery out of nowhere in part two. All of this, of course, could have been avoided if they'd made some tweaks to part one. Like, let's say they shortened the runtime by about half and cut out all the superfluous material and maybe made it air as a double feature with an also shortened part two, and maybe they just gave the whole thing one collective name, like they just cut the parts and smushed them together and released it as one thing and just called it Mockingjay. I don't know. Probably could have helped. Mockingjay Part 1 was met with okay reception when it released in 2014. It got 68% favorable reviews on Rotten Tomatoes, lower than either previous film, but not the worst thing in the world either. It made about 100 million less than Catching Fire. Again, not the best, but not some horrible death knell for the franchise either. As far as fan reception goes, it was received with lukewarm sentiments. The general consensus seemed to be, well, that was okay. On the whole, Mockingjay Part 1 was just a very mediocre movie. Not horrible, just mediocre. In the real world, some of the ties were starting to turn on Jennifer Lawrence, with some people being absolute fucking creeps to her and deciding that, after being queen of the internet for years, that she was an awful person because she was justifiably upset after someone leaked personal pictures of hers. I said people. I should have meant men on Reddit. <laughs> on the more progressive side of things, some internet users were also just getting tired of her uber-relatable persona, feeling like it was either cringy and performative, or that it often crossed the line into too much irreverence. This would come to a head a couple years later after she made a joke about using a sacred rock in Hawaii to scratch her butt and had to apologize for it. Basically, the whole I'm not like other Hollywood actresses because I eat pizza thing was just kind of getting old for some people. Nevertheless, her actual film career had skyrocketed as a result of the Hunger Games series as she continued to star in X-Men films and get several Golden Globes and several Academy Award nominations, including a win for Silver Linings Playbook. She was, in fact, well on track to be the highest paid actress in the world next year. As much as could be said about Mockingjay Part 1, it not only kept Lawrence's name a household one, but, much like its two predecessors, also served as a jumping off point for what could now easily be defined as global superstardom. Online discussions about The Hunger Games weren't filled with the exact same hype as they were during its height last year, but fandom spaces were still by and large active and were still pretty excited for the final installment of the series. This was it. This was the epic finale of the fanbase. This was where the Hunger Games series would come to an end. There was hype. There was excitement. There would be tears. There was a movie, I guess. It certainly was a motion picture. <laughs> I can't even call it bad. There was some legitimately good stuff in here. The acting is mostly great as always, the action scenes are pretty enjoyable, the cinematography has nothing wrong with it, most of the major plot points are faithful to the book, it's fine. Plus it got a 69% on Rotten Tomatoes, which, nice. But once again, it really suffers from some of the same problems part one had, the problem of being a two-part film that had no business being two parts. Scenes feel stretched out and repetitive, Coin suddenly becoming an evil fascist felt jarring because of the two movies choice, and the cast feels almost exhausted at times, with very little chemistry between most of the lead actors. It's difficult to tell what's supposed to be Katniss's trauma and what's just Jennifer Lawrence going through the motions after having to churn out four of these things when she sits in the dark and monotonously tells an equally catatonic PETA he matters to her, and either way, it's just not super compelling. And part of that is because if it is meant to be a representation of her trauma, once again, several aspects of this book had to be severely sanitized for a PG-13 rating, meaning some of Katniss's worst traumas go relatively unexplored. Some of the issues were outside the filmmaker's control. For example, they had to severely limit the role of Philip Seymour Hoffman's character after his tragic death in real life because they didn't have a lot of footage to work around. But a lot of these issues feel like a direct result of the two movie split. Even at its best, it feels like half a movie, and that's just not really what you want for your epic conclusion. And 
that's how the Hunger Games saga ended. Not with a bang, not really with a whimper, more just with shrugs and polite applause. It was the lowest grossing Hunger Games film at $658 million, still a lot, but decidedly less than any of its predecessors. Critics slammed its slow pacing, but had mostly middling things to say about it. It won some Teen Choice Awards, but nothing prestigious. It was just anticlimactic. An anticlimactic way to end a series that had so recently taken the world by storm. The Hunger Games fandom decreased in its volume and popularity soon thereafter, too. You can see from just a simple Google Trends search that it had a bit of a raise as the book started to come out, it grew and grew as hype built for the film in 2010, then it had this fucking massive spike in 2012, and another pretty big one in 2013, and then it kinda just petered out. Every film release generating less and less hype than the last, and then just a casual meandering descent into a relative flatline. The Hunger Games fandom isn't completely dead now or anything. I mean, there are still fans and fan communities, but even just looking at the graph, it's very easy to tell that once the films were done and failed to generate that much hype, it just kind of casually died down. It's almost a shame, because for all the shit I can give certain YA dystopias, The Hunger Games is a pretty good testament to its genre. It's Certainly not a perfect book series, but it had something to say and was overall pretty effective at communicating its themes. It had a gripping story and compelling characters and a fun premise, and for a YA series directed at teens, what more can you really ask for? But that decrease in hype for The Hunger Games most certainly did not mean that the genre of YA dystopias was dead. Much to the contrary, because what The Hunger Games lacked in generating hype for its own ending, it far made up for in what it did to the YA dystopia niche. This book jumpstarted a fucking golden age of these books, and many of them were... Interesting. So like anything that gets popular, The Hunger Games was bound to cause a wave of imitators. This isn't really surprising, the previous generation had seen it with the post-Twilight rise in paranormal romance books. And it's not even necessarily always a cynical cash grab thing either. Like, it's natural, if you're someone who just read a book that you really liked, you're probably gonna want to find books of a similar genre to move on to. So with The Hunger Games books over and out, it was time for a wave of other dystopian YA novels. And largely speaking, the results were, uh, bad. I think there's something weirdly fascinating about those trend-chasing YA dystopian novels. Like, when you get down to it, a lot of follow-the-leader fiction is gonna be a bit, well, sloppy because they're often rushed and put out without much scrutiny to capitalize on the success of the current popular movement. But YA dystopia has a roadblock that I'd say is relatively unique to its genre in that, more so than a lot of other popular YA trends, it requires a fair bit of world-building and commentary. Like, if you're writing a Twilight knockoff, you don't need much. You just need to borrow some well-known supernatural entity, come up with a romance, maybe come up with some basic lore in order to provide some sort of hook, and you can pretty much get away with it. But dystopian stories need to be about something. You have to come up with an evil government and crap sack world, which means coming up with a reason why that government is evil and why the world is so crap sack. And it usually needs to be a fairly unique reason, given that oftentimes the major selling point isn't just the dystopia itself, it's why, specifically, this particular world is so fucked up. You need some sort of hook. And this is where stuff gets dumb. Like, really, really dumb. It's where you get stuff like, In Talia's world, there is no need for food. Everyone takes medication, or inox, to ward off hunger. It should mean that there is no more famine, no more obesity, no more food-related illnesses, and no more war. Like all who have the pulse, Faith Daniels and Dylan Gilmore have telekinetic powers. They can move objects with their mind. But there are five second pulses in the world who have an even greater power. Almost nothing can harm them. They are virtually indestructible. Ever since the proper noun switch, when the oxygen levels plummeted and most of humanity died, the survivors have been protected in glass domes full of manufactured air. Protected or trapped or controlled. In the community, there is no more pain or war. Implanted computer chips have wiped humanity clean of destructive emotions, and thoughts are replaced by a feed from the Link Network. The barcode tattoo. Everybody's getting it. It will make your life easier, they say. It will hook you in. It will become your identity. But what if you say no? 
What if you don't want to become a code? Callie lost her parents when the Spore Wars wiped out everyone between the ages of 20 and 60. She and her little brother Tyler go on the run, living as squatters with their friend Michael and fighting off renegades who would kill them for a cookie. Callie's only hope is Prime Destinations, a disturbing place in Beverly Hills run by a mysterious figure known as the Old Man. Anax thinks she knows history. Her grueling all-day examination has just begun, and if she passes, she'll be admitted into the Academy, the elite governing institution of her utopian society. But Anax is about to discover that for all her learning, the history she's been taught isn't the whole story. Let's go through this piece by piece, shall we? Okay, so there's a lot to unpack here, and we can't really focus on all of these individually, so let's just pick apart a few trends. So one of the biggest things that stands out when you go through these is the generic capitalized names trying to be ominous. A lot of these more cash-grabby YA books are filled with terms like the city and the test and the exam to refer to things, which is a quick way to make something seem more untrustworthy. Like, which sounds scarier, saying I'm going to school or saying I'm going to the school. But it's also just <laughs> lazy and silly, like nobody talks like that. Even in a dystopia, I can't imagine being like, yes, I'm really excited to go home and watch the video essay. When not doing too little world building, they're doing too much. Things like having weird complicated slang names, like what if food was called Inox? Like, yeah, yeah, it would be fucked up if you called it that. <laughs> Why are we calling it that? What does that word even mean? But this is all nitpicky stuff, and it's not unique to dystopian YA or anything like that. Even ostensibly serious stuff for adults still has stuff like, oh, I have to be careful about driving this car since they're illegal because of the motor laws. It's silly, but it's not a deal breaker. A more prominent issue is with the basic premise of them overall. In general, the main job of dystopian fiction is to provide some commentary on the world that we currently live in by taking aspects of the modern day and exaggerating them to a heightened and scary extreme. They often serve as cautionary tales, showing us what modern issues could look like under a fictional lens. What tends to separate good dystopian fiction and bad dystopian fiction is whether or not it actually has something to say and what kind kind of commentary it's providing. That's not to say that every story that uses dystopian imagery needs to treat it with the same rigor and intensity of a Margaret Atwood novel. You can use it for popcorn entertainment, but it helps to be saying something. I mean, even Sonic the Hedgehog is about saving the environment from industrialization. But as you dig more and more into the dystopian YA genre, the more it becomes clear that a lot of the weaker works are less about the commentary of a dystopia and more of the aesthetics of one. It's about creating an evil world with an evil army and cool protagonists to fight against that evil army. And once again, this isn't a bad thing in and of itself. The original Star Wars trilogy is essentially dystopian fiction, and it's great and fun and utilizes the aesthetics well. But it's also saying something about the concept of fascism and uses that imagery in order to comment on how terrible it would be to live in a system like that. So many of these premises are just nonsense. Like, there might be a sliver of actual commentary in them, stuff about, like, worrying about clean air or food supplies or whatever, but it's often heightened to such absurd levels that it's hard to even take seriously. Like, that one about living in glass domes of air, that's just the Lorax movie. Like, am I supposed to take that seriously? Am I supposed to take the conflict from the Lorax, the Onesler movie with Taylor Swift seriously? Am I? But then you get other ones like, what if everyone had barcodes? Or what if we had to live in the aftermath of the Spore Wars? And it's like, oh God, oh no, not the Spore Wars. This has given me a lot to think about regarding the future. I really hope our modern day society can come together to change the way we think about the Spore Wars. When it wasn't that, it was stuff clearly catering to a teenage demographic in a very juvenile and honestly slightly patronizing way. Things like, what if you had to go to a school and take tests? Or what if you had to devote yourself to a clique? Or what if the government told you who to love, but not in a gay way or anything like that, just in the way that your parents won't let you date Thomas, even though Thomas is the cutest boy in your class and really good at writing poetry. Oh God, and that's not even getting into the really, really, really fucking bad premises like Save the Pearls. Google it. 
In general, one big change seems to be a shift from stories about the government being bad to stories about the protagonists being cool. Like, for some reason, a fuck ton of these books focus on teenagers with psychic powers. Like, there are so many YA books where the premise is just that the government hates psychic kids and the cool main protagonist gets psychic powers and now is on the run. It's, it's just very weird. Why was it always psychic powers? Was that just the sexiest superpower? It might seem like a small change, but it actually has a pretty big impact on the stories themselves. A large trend in dystopian media is that the protagonist is generally a basic ordinary person, at least at the start of the story. Everyman characters, while not best suited for every genre, are popular in fiction in general, especially escapist fiction, as it allows an easy vessel to introduce world building as well as an audience surrogate. It's a lot easier to project yourself onto an average Joe than it is to project yourself onto Thor Ragnarsson, just your ordinary Norse god high schooler. But it also plays an important part specifically in the narrative of a dystopia. It's important to see how the terribleness of the government affects everyday people, how a normal person gets by, and ultimately how they are crushed by or how they overcome said system. Katniss becomes a well-known heroic figure in Panem, but at the heart of it, she was just a regular girl who only gained the importance she did via tenacity. And that just makes the heavy use of psychic powers in these stories feel weird. Like, even if we go back to one of the first stories I can think of that did It's a Dystopia Going After Kids with Psychic Powers, Akira, none of the psychic children are the main characters. Our main focus is Kaneda, who has the specialized skill of biking, but nothing that makes him that much more extraordinary than anyone else in Neo Tokyo. Like, a lot of these books are less dystopian YA and more X-Men stories. And not even, like, a good X-Men story, just the ones that talk about how cool it is to be psychic and wouldn't it be fucked up if you were chased by the government because of your cool psychic powers? It comes with unintentional commentary, the idea of creating a government that isn't really that bad for everyday people, just those they think are too powerful and special and unique. And that is as good a way as any to segue into perhaps the biggest of the YA dystopian series to ride the coattails of The Hunger Games. Divergent. Divergent tells the story of a dangerous dystopian city known as Chicago. In the land of Chicago, society is separated into five different factions based on five basic human traits. Abnegation, nice, candor, honest, amity, farmer, erudite, smart but Slytherin, and finally, Dauntless, liking parkour. <laughs> when children turn 16, they are forced to take this serum and undergo a test that tells them what their primary trait is, and then they pledge to be in one faction for life. The story follows Triss, a young girl who takes the test and discovers a surprise. She's a divergent, aka someone who has more than one personality trait. That sounds like a joke, but no, that's that's what a divergent is. If you're smart, but also honest, then congrats, you're divergent. Anyway, apparently divergents are hunted down by the government because they go outside the faction system and thus cannot be controlled, so Triss decides to hide this info and go into Dauntless, the cool faction that does parkour and zip lines. But it turns out there's a secret conspiracy, and now Triss has to deal with the government and her feelings for her mentor, a guy who, at this point, is known only by the name Four. The Divergent series was wildly popular. The books sold over 32 million copies, there were three movies made, and this is anecdotal evidence, I know, but it was always front and center at every Scholastic book fair. Its 2014 film adaptation, starring Shailene Woodley and her brother Ansel Elgort, not to be confused with The Fault in Our Stars, a 2014 film adaptation starring Shailene Woodley and her boyfriend Ansel Elgort, grossed $307 million. This was one of the only other dystopian YA series to be anywhere close to the popularity of The Hunger Games, which is quite an impressive feat because Divergent is terrible. Everything about Divergent just feels so cynically designed to be popular. That isn't to say that author Veronica Roth made the series as a cash grab, it's actually very clearly the passion project of a university student, but the series honestly just hits so many of the basic tropes that it's hard not to see it as a concerted effort to pander to fans of the genre. I mean, the publishers certainly knew, based on how similar the covers of 
the books are to the Hunger Games. It can best be described as the aesthetics and love story of the Hunger Games mixed with the house system from Harry Potter. They even had their own quiz you could take to figure out what faction you were in, although it never caught on in the way that the Hogwarts houses did, because why would anybody want to be anything other than Dauntless, who are basically the theater kids parkouring all over Denny's at 3am? And the basic concept just doesn't hold up to any real scrutiny. Going back to what I said earlier, dystopian stories often work better when they're reflective of issues we worry about in our modern day. Things like oppression, class differences, environmental destruction, sexism, racism, things like that. But I just don't understand what issue Divergent is supposed to be commenting on. Like, okay, I can definitely understand the drama and commentary of making a story in which the government and society places people into a certain binary where you're expected to be for the rest of your life and any sort of movement from one binary to another, or maybe not following a certain binary role at all, is discouraged and why, yes, my trans co-writer Emily did in fact write this section. But that's not really the story that Divergent is trying to tell. Part of this issue is the way the factions are done and the idea of being Divergent in general. The world of Divergent is a world where it's apparently rare to be both brave and smart, or honest and caring, or nice and a farmer. It's based so much on basic human emotions rather than anything actually telling that it becomes hard to take seriously. Like even in my most paranoid moments, I'm not sitting up late at night wondering, oh god, what if the government classifies me as nice? And weirdly enough, it doesn't actually seem to criticize the faction system all that much. In the first book, there's not really a moment where the characters rebel against the faction system or speak up about how bad it seems. If they get anywhere close to that, it's because they're talking about how much it sucks that they get attacked for being a divergent. Characters talk about how factions don't matter and you shouldn't judge people for being in a certain faction and then use the faction they're in as an insult. And the climax slash inciting incident, because this thing is paced horribly, doesn't focus on realizing that the government is bad for dividing everyone else, but rather fighting back against Erudite, the evil faction trying to take over the government from the good faction. The implication, whether intentional or not, is that the characters' lives would have been totally fine continuing with things the way they were going if it wasn't for one faction turning evil. This is also where we really deal with that protagonist problem I mentioned earlier. Much like Katniss, Triss becomes a central figure in the fight against the government. But unlike Katniss, who becomes notable because of her actions and skills, Triss becomes notable because of how she's born. And sure, Triss does train to stay in Dauntless and becomes physically capable and competent and all that, but it doesn't change the fact that Triss is presented as a very special person, largely because of the circumstances of her birth. There's even this thing they added in the second movie where uh, there's this box that needs to be opened, but no joke, they literally say, only a divergent can open this box, which is one, a buck wild thing to have Academy Award winning actress Kate Winslet say in a movie, and two, fucking stupid as hell. Like, congrats on having two personality traits, you can now properly use the mother box to contact the new gods. Additionally, you need to not just be a divergent to open the box, but a stronger, very special divergent, aka Triss. It's really, really, really dumb. All this weird, you are super special stuff isn't helped by the third book, which explains the origins of divergence. That essentially years ago, scientists wanted to fix society by modifying people's genes. When this went horribly wrong, they separated everyone into their own factions in some sort of weird experiment in order to over time create more divergence, aka genetically pure individuals, in order to fix the damage done to genes in something called the Purity War. So the main heroes of Divergent are those who are more genetically pure than the others around them. And you can express several emotions and personality traits like four, but still not be a proper Divergent because your genes are damaged, meaning you're a mutant. I don't know if I need to comment on what that all sounds like. I'll just say it was a bold choice for the series to start off with a premise as silly as, imagine if everyone was separated into factions by the government and end it with, we need more genetically pure people to save the world and fix the gene pool. It's very, um, friend of movie Bob, if you catch my drift. Even if we ignore the potential implications of this revelation, the Divergent series really isn't written well at all. Characters are all pretty flat stereotypes, the world is nonsensical, <laughs> there's a serum for everything, like everything. 
memory serum, testing serum, mind control serum, dream serum, a different testing serum, a serum that makes you hallucinate, another serum that makes you hallucinate, death serum. There might as well just be a serum that you throw on walls to make walls stronger or whatever. The low quality of the books translate to the movies as well, which are just honestly bad. Like I could understand someone loving the books, but the movies are at best boring and nonsensical. And the difference between them and say The Hunger Games is night and day. The Hunger Games films for all their faults are fairly grounded and take the subject matter seriously. The direction is there to immerse you into the world and atmosphere of Panem, which happens to be very bleak. But Divergent spends a fair amount of time in its dystopia with these brightly lit scenes, moments trying super hard to look cool and badass and fun with like pop songs playing in the background. It's just that like nothing about the direction sells the seriousness of the situation or the terrible state of the world. But for the most part, people loved the series. It was never quite as big as The Hunger Games, sure, but the book sold more than 32 million copies. That's a lot. And the films were enough of a box office success for three movies to be made. But then they weren't anymore. <laughs> Okay, so for starters, on a real basic level, the final Divergent book, Allegiant, is not very well liked by fans. Like, it still seems to be a divisive topic in the fandom. A lot of this is because, <laughs> spoilers for the final Divergent book, Triss dies at the end. She makes what a lot of people consider to be a pointless sacrifice, and she dies. The backlash to this was so severe that when Allegiant first released, fans review bombed it to 2.5 stars on Amazon, which is incredibly low for a book this popular. So of course, once it came time to make a movie of it, the studio decided to split it into two parts, Allegiant and Ascendant. Because if it worked for Twilight, Harry Potter, and sort of The Hunger Games, then it'll work here too. There's a variety of problems with this. One is that the book they were adapting and doubling up on was already pretty unpopular, so thinking that fans would want to see it done even longer was wishful thinking. Two, by this point, the movie multi-pack trend had started to die as films that did it started to get more and more backlash. Oftentimes, these adaptations would be poorly paced and padded to clearly stretch for time in order to justify keeping a popular franchise around for another year and hopefully doubling up box office grosses, and after a while, it became not just obvious what was going on, but it also started to play a stronger effect on the quality of the end product. Even The Hunger Games suffered from this, with the final Mockingjay film overall grossing less than any of the previous movies before it and suffering worse reviews. Fun film fact, this is also partly the reason why Avengers Infinity War and Endgame changed their names from Infinity War Part 1 and 2, and why the theatrical cut of Justice League was changed into a standalone film. There's also the third factor, which is that people didn't like the Divergent films. And I'm not just talking about general audiences, I'm talking about fans too. The second film, Insurgent, was wildly different from the book, dropping a lot of things like the exploration of Triss's trauma and adding things like the box that only a powerful Divergent could open. To a fair number of fans, Insurgent was just as bad of an adaptation as the Percy Jackson films or Cirque du Freak or Golden Compass. And so when Allegiant's trailer dropped and showed just as many differences and inaccuracies, well, fans weren't really motivated to see it. And so they didn't. And when the film came out in March of 2016, it opened up at number two in the box office, beaten out by Zootopia. By the end of its box office run, Allegiant only made $179.2 million worldwide, which seems like a lot of money, but the film had a budget of anywhere from $110 to $149 million. The general rule of thumb is that for a film to break even, it needs to make at least twice its budget in order to account for things like marketing, home release cost, and other various things like that. Meaning, by rough calculation, Allegiant probably lost the studio around $50 million. This led to a huge change in plans for Lionsgate. The final film was no longer going to be a theatrical release, but rather a made-for-TV movie that would lead into a spin-off television series that would go beyond the books. This never actually ended up happening, though. For starters, Triss's actor Shailene Woodley frequently expressed her disinterest in doing the final part on TV, saying that she would only be interested in returning if it were a theatrical release. From what I can tell, none of the cast was really that into the idea. I mean, even 
since then, you've had people like Woodley and co-star Zoe Kravitz talk about how much they didn't like Allegiant, with Woodley saying the experience almost made her quit acting entirely. If it was such a miserable experience, why would you agree to come back for presumably less money on a theoretically lesser platform as punishment for the film nobody liked doing badly? So yeah, after years of Lionsgate saying, don't worry, it's gonna happen, it never actually happened, leaving the Divergent film series seemingly forever unfinished. Which is great if you're a Triss fan, because it means she's still alive, so you know, <laughs> mistakes into miracles. The fall of Divergent is really interesting. Here you had a series that theoretically people liked, that theoretically was popular, that theoretically made a lot of money, and then one day people just seemed to stop being interested in it anymore. And while that could be explained by the previous things I mentioned, like the dislike of the final book and the film adaptations, it seems like more of a part of a grander whole. Because when Allegiant failed, it didn't just kill Divergent. It seemed to kill YA dystopia as a whole. I think it's pretty safe to say that right now, in the year of our Lord 2021, that the YA dystopia genre is essentially dead, right? Like there haven't been any other notable adaptations or additions in a while, nothing that's taken the world by storm, and it doesn't even seem to be having a renaissance the same way Twilight is. And on the surface, that's, well, normal. Genres rise and fall and lose popularity and maybe gain momentum again. YA dystopia was always a bubble that was gonna burst and be replaced by something else. I guess the question is just why did it burst and what replaced it? Based on my research and analysis skills and also just being around at the time, I want to say that there was a dramatic shift around 2015 or 2016. This is where it seems like there's the most demonstrable evidence of a change. Things like the final Hunger Games movie releasing, and what would end up being the final Divergent movie releasing. It's pretty typical for genres to fade out once the most popular work in that genre is officially wrapped. I mean, we saw this back in 2012 when Breaking Dawn Part 2 came out. With no new Twilight media on the imminent horizon, paranormal romance stories eventually got pushed to the side while the Hunger Games began to take the spotlight with the first movie adaptation coming out and being a huge success. But the difference is that Breaking Dawn Part 2 ended things by being the highest grossing Twilight movie, and Mockingjay Part 2 ended things off being the lowest grossing Hunger Games movie. Additionally, while the Twilight fandom would see a resurgence years down the line with the release of the alternate perspective novel Midnight Sun, the release of the Hunger Games prequel novel The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes released with what felt like a thud. Like it reviewed fine and seemed to sell fine, and fan reception seems to be that it's fine, but nothing has really kicked off a big obvious revival of the franchise, not yet at least. All this points to there being something more here than just the natural end of a genre. Like if the big stuff like The Hunger Games and to a lesser extent Divergent seem to be struggling to pick itself up, then it's clear that just something about the concept of the YA dystopia genre as a whole was just not really resonating anymore. Some of this is a matter of quality, sure. As previously stated, the final Hunger Games and Divergent books were divisive at best and their film adaptations were viewed as unnecessarily padded in order to fill double the runtime. If the quality starts to suffer, then it makes sense that by extension the popularity will suffer in turn. And this plays into what I was saying earlier about the overall state of YA dystopian literature and how absurd it started to get. As more and more books trying to be the next Hunger Games came out, each with their own over-the-top and absurd premises for a dictatorship, it's easy to burn out on the concept as a whole and struggle to really take it seriously. Even the better written stuff can be almost tainted by association in the eyes of some readers. But on a deeper level, I think this drop in quality and increased incredulity of the plot lines leads into a problem that YA dystopian novels always had but was becoming more obvious over time. Issues with the way these books utilize the concept of oppression to create entertainment fodder. On the surface, this isn't necessarily a bad thing. A lot of stories utilize oppression and tropes associated with it, like fascism and corrupt governments and dystopian societies to get their point across and are still generally liked and accepted. Things like Star Wars, um, if we go into more the realm of things for youth, Avatar The Last Airbender, the recent She-Ra adaptation, but the thing that a lot of these series have is that, for the most part, they take place in more fantastical worlds and stories. There might be parallels to the real world or actual imagery and events, but it's done through enough of a layer of escapist 
based storytelling that it doesn't feel quite as literal. A lot of dystopian YA novels, however, don't have that luxury. A lot of them are explicitly written to take place in the US, or are at the very least societies modeled after it or other modern nations. Their governments are based on American governments. The imagery associated is, even at its most fantastical, decidedly based on real ways that real governments can mistreat real people. And keep in mind, this isn't necessarily bad. As I've said before, dystopian stories work best when they're reflective of actual societal issues and injustices. It makes the stories not just more engaging, but also more important. But it's hard to be able to enjoy popcorn entertainment about fighting injustices when they so closely resemble actual injustices in the world around you. Stories like The Hunger Games or Divergent take place in a world where the government actively oppresses their citizens, where some people are viewed as lesser or greater than others, where state violence and brutality is rampant and normalized. But at the heart of it, even when portrayed well, it so often misses out on actual aspects of actual oppression. These stories often take place in race-blind and gender-blind worlds where society is shitty and horrible to people, but things like racism or sexism or homophobia phobia or transphobia just aren't a thing. That's fine in and of itself. Not every fictional work has to deal with these aspects, and in some ways it can be nice to have fiction that doesn't. But if you're writing stories about systemic injustices, often ones that have in some form occurred to real people in real life, that don't seem to actually focus on what those injustices actually look like, it can feel hollow at best and tasteless at worst. This isn't helped by the fact that a lot of these stories, and especially their film adaptations, tend to feature predominantly white lead characters characters who are also almost always canonically cis and straight. Like there might be people of color or queer characters around, but they often get reduced to best friends or mentors or people who exist solely to assist our main protagonists. For example, all of the Hunger Games films feature people of color who help Katniss out and are then killed in order to make her feel bad. Diverse dystopian YA books, particularly ones written by or featuring people of color as leads, do exist, but when you look at the ones getting the most book sales, the most film adaptations, it tends to be about, like, brunette, white teenage girls. <laughs> It also comes with the after effect of making these stories feel very individual centric. Once again, you're back at the divergent problem. By making these stories about the very cool, sexy teenagers who manage to sexily take down the government, you end up creating the narrative of the cool individual who manages to defeat systemic injustice and governments who hate that person and that person specifically. When you take that into consideration, in some ways it's easy to see why the genre took a nosedive specifically around 2015 and 2016. This was an era where public consciousness towards systemic problems and oppression was on the rise. Things like the 2014 Ferguson protests and the Black Lives Matter movement were front and center in a lot of people's minds. Racial violence and injustice against people of color had existed for years and years and years, but it was now becoming harder to ignore. And when you see what actual people actually working together to fight systemic violence looks like and the way they're treated and abused in real life because of it, seeing young white teenagers being the ones experiencing that exact form of oppression and saving the world and doing those things can feel a bit tasteless. It is interesting to note that one of the biggest YA books in the post-dystopia landscape was The Hate You Give, a realistic story about a young black girl dealing with the after effects of her friend being murdered by a racist police officer. Or, well, I can just say police officer. And in the wake of that book's success, we've seen a lot more books marketed toward teens about social issues become bestsellers. 2015 and 2016 also gave us, well, I don't know if you remember, but there was a pretty big thing that happened in America in 2016 that not a lot of people really expected. <laughs> yeah, so the US elected a fascist to the presidency, and that sucked and wasn't fun. And things were quite bad for a lot of people well before then, but it became a lot more visible and a lot more noticeable, especially to the kinds of demographics who you often see writing and consuming dystopian YA. When you start to see fascist rhetoric, enter the modern political sphere with such extremity. When it's such a realistic thing to fear, suddenly it's not really all that enjoyable to see expressed through a fun fictional lens. In fact, it's really interesting that the one dystopian story that maintained popularity during the Trump administration was The Handmaid's Tale, particularly its television adaptation on Hulu, which I have my own personal issues with, but I already got a legal threat from Homestuck, don't want to get a legal threat from the Church of Scientology right now. 
Its world where a conservative government strips rights away from women resonated well in that era, with the Handmaid's uniform becoming a common sight at women's rights protests during this time. It was a dystopian tale that was both more geared toward adults and based upon existing contemporary issues that seriously tackled and acknowledged those things as an overall systemic problem. Going back to the way these YA series were set up, oftentimes the conflicts there felt so simplistic. Once again, we're at that individualistic look of things. You're setting up a story where you have your clear-cut strong hero who manages to take down the evil government person. But it often doesn't work like that, and that was becoming increasingly clear to people. In real life, the troops don't just stop because you manage to blow up the control ship. It's not necessarily about taking down one evil guy in power, because those issues persist even beyond then. They exist in the way governments are structured, and in the thoughts of the people who enforce the laws, and in the overall culture, and in the economy. If we go with the idea that the Trump administration and other overtly fascistic conservative governments that came to prominence around 2016 are partially responsible for killing the allure of these stories, you may think that once Trump and those other bad government figures are gone that people will gravitate back to those stories, but no, not really. Because the reality is that even after the Trump administration, as much as certain people want to ignore the fact that this is the case, a lot of the problems that people are having with money and racism and bodily autonomy and women's and LGBTQ rights, they're still having. And getting rid of one asshole in power isn't going to fix that. This note about endings is really interesting when compared to a lot of the more adult-focused dystopian stories. In things like Handmaid's Tale, or 1984, or Fahrenheit 451, or films like Brazil and Blade Runner, or even older children's literature like The Giver, the endings tend to be a lot more along the lines of ambiguous at best, outright depressing at worst. Oftentimes they end with the world not really dramatically different. Life goes on, the government is still in power. Maybe there'll be a hint that something will change, but that's it. Maybe you'll get some sort of ambiguous ending that'll show that the protagonist maybe lives or maybe goes on to do good elsewhere. But in a lot of scenarios, the protagonist actually becomes a victim of the government and loses their mind or gains some form of conditioning. There's no moment where the protagonist picks up a sword and rifle and becomes some big hero. The film Brazil actually makes fun of this, as the ending features a long sequence in which the main character Sam is rescued before being tortured and he manages to make this daring escape with rebellion leaders and he meets the girl of his dreams and they ride off together, only for it to cut back to show us Sam still in his torture chair, his mind now totally gone as he hallucinates a better world for himself. It's really interesting. It's as if a lot of these stories understand that the issues can't easily be changed by a single person, or that trying to scare the reader into understanding the stakes of the issue can be more important than presenting an easy, defeat the government, save the world narrative. The Hunger Games almost gets it right by showcasing that taking down the capital and gaining control of Panem isn't the end of the story, but mangles it by instead landing on a both sides bad narrative that showcases that the rebels using violence to take down fascists will end up just as violent as the fascists they take down. Now, I'm not here to give commentary on how one should properly protest or express displeasure with the government. Like, I would never say, for example, you should throw a brick at a cop. But I will say that this is one of the things about Mockingjay that has aged the worst, as in an age where more and more people actually did have to speak out and fight, sometimes violently, against a dangerous government, it feels a little bit Facebook-lib to go, well, I think both sides are bad. In a lot of respects, YA dystopia feels like a product that could really only exist in the Obama era. At least according to the Facebook lib culture, it was that period of time where everything was fixed. You know, you'd gotten rid of the previous conservative leader, made great social progress, we're in a post-race society. And really, the only issue that a lot of Americans seemed to care about was stuff involving the recession and other aspects of the economy. So you got works like The Hunger Games, where money and class divides were the most prominent issue in the society. And then once that was played out, things just got more and more desperate and absurd until we were using things like psychic powers as the main point of conflict plaguing society. And that hopefulness of, well, 
we got rid of the asshole in power and now everything's totally good and fine is very much reflected in, as I said, those stories' very simplistic endings. Maybe this is all baseless speculation. Maybe it is really just as simple as trends get old and die. But there's definitely a lot about this genre to analyze and a lot about it that feels weird given how the political sphere has evolved since the last big YA dystopian success. So that's where we are now. A YA litscape that was once dominated by hundreds of stories about cool psychic teens taking down evil governments has shifted focus, at least in the majority of cases. Fans of dystopia's focus on contemporary social issues seem to have moved on more to books more directly about actual contemporary social issues, and fans of its more fantastical or romantic elements seem to have moved on to magic royal stories all named shit like a bone of thorn and bone. And over time, as trends shift and more low-quality cash-ins start to dilute the market, we're probably going to see a big decrease in those too, at least for a little while. But I think the rise and fall of YA dystopia specifically the way the genre so clearly reflected the sensibilities of a certain era and the way it vanished as the world around it shifted is just so incredibly fascinating. I don't want to say The Hunger Games wouldn't be popular if it released today, but I do think, at the very least, that what audiences are looking for and want to read has gone through significant shifts, ones that are extremely clear when you look at the global context surrounding when and which YA dystopia was popular. Honestly, I'd be pretty curious to see the way a series like that would have to adapt to reflect a more contemporary market a decade and a half later. As it currently stands, there's just less demand for that kind of story. As I said, we didn't see a big Hunger Games renaissance the way we do for Twilight, and it makes me wonder when and if the genre ever does make a big formalized comeback, what that's going to look like, what new fears the stories are going to have to play on. Like, are we going to get a bunch of virus stories, or will no one want to read about some Riverdaleified version of it after seeing the absolute banal evil of the last two years? Will racial and class inequalities play a larger role in future dystopias? How exactly will they address some of the reasons a lot of people just don't want to read stuff like Divergent anymore? Whatever the climate of future young adult literature and future dystopia ends up looking like, one thing will always remain the same. <laughs> it sure would be fucked up if you had to fight in the Spore Wars. Honestly, for all I've said about YA dystopia books and some of the less incredible knockoffs, several of these stories still hold value. There's still interesting to read in the modern day, interesting to see in what ways it was a product of its time and what it can tell us about then and what it can tell us about now. So if you're interested in checking out The Hunger Games now, especially for free, you can actually do that with my sponsor Audible. Audible is this really cool service that lets you listen to thousands of really great audiobooks, whether you're into something more adult-oriented like Brave New World or something with parkour like Divergent. You can also get stuff from Audible's Plus catalog, which includes podcasts, audiobooks, sleep and fitness tracks, and Audible originals that you can't listen to anywhere else. But I would definitely personally recommend the Hunger Games audiobook narrated by Tatiana Maslany. It's just very cool, and I know I was able to refresh myself on a lot of super neat details from the story. If you're interested in exploring Audible and listening to some really cool audiobooks like The Hunger Games, you can get a free 30-day trial at audible.com slash Sarah or by texting Sarah Z to 500-500. to everyone who's still stuck around. Uh, I wanted to say uh, a couple things. Uh, firstly, I just wanted to thank everybody for just kind of the outpouring of support uh, that a lot of people gave me after the last video. That really meant a lot, and I really greatly appreciate that. Um, I hope that you liked this one too. I, I hope that I can keep making interesting stuff that people want to watch. 
Um, by the way, I did also want to say uh, the mug that I was holding, the first mug, not the second mug, the first mug that I was holding in this video, the Young, Dumb, and Full of Libel mug. Um, if you are interested in getting one of these, it is your last chance. Uh, we've ordered um, 36 more of these mugs and those are, those are gonna be the last ones. And so if you're interested in this uh, <laughs> scarce product, you can get it uh, at my merch store and the link is just in the description for that. Uh, or if you want uh, this other mug of mine, which says uh, respect women juice, 100% uh, natural and is kind of this cool oblong shape. You can also get that uh, at the same merch link. I've also got uh, like some pins and some stickers, um, which I really like. I think they're really cool. And so you can just check out the link in my description for that. I hope that everybody is having a good autumn and yeah, see you later.